Good morning, good afternoon. My name is Tracy Cook and I'm with SACS Healthcare Communications. Before I introduce our moderator, James Simmons, and our speakers, Dr. Bridget Joseph and Atman Shah, I would like to show our audience how to send questions and comments. You can type your questions directly into the questions box. You may send your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them as many as possible during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Our moderator today is James Simmons. Dr. Simmons is currently an acute care nurse practitioner at UCLA Ronald Reagan Medical Center, Los Angeles, California. He is a guest lecturer, UCLA School of Nursing Master's Entry Clinical Nurse Program. He is an adjunct lecturer, acute care nurse practitioner program, University of Illinois Chicago College of Nursing, and he is a co-host of Drop the Subject, a nationally syndicated talk radio program on radio.com. He is featured as a healthcare expert on numerous television, radio, podcast, and social media programming. James, welcome. Thank you very much, Tracy, for that very kind introduction. And good morning, good afternoon to everyone uh, watching and listening right now. So the title of today's webinar is Mechanical CPR, The Incredible Journey. I love that title. It is an incredible journey. We are fortunate to have two incredible Dr. Joseph is a certified clinical nurse specialist and resuscitation committee nurse specialist. Currently, Dr. Joseph is program director of the Emergency Cardiovascular Care Center at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. She holds a concurrent position as the director of simulation education, Department of Nursing at the same institution. Additionally, she has worked in a variety of fields and specialties as a legal nurse expert consultant, an interprofessional education consultant, and continues conducting clinical research with focus on resuscitation. Dr. Joseph has also been an invited speaker at numerous medical conferences. Welcome, Dr. Joseph. And Dr. Shaw is with us as well. Dr. Shaw is an interventional cardiologist specializing in minimally invasive, catheter-based minimally invasive techniques at Mild Stomping Grounds, University of Chicago Medicine. His research efforts focus on improving survival rates in patients who have experienced a cardiac arrest or an acute myocardial infarction. He has authored six book chapters and more than 50 abstracts and publications. A dedicated educator, he trains medical students, residents, and fellows. He is the recipient of several honors and awards for clinical service, leadership, and training. Welcome, Dr. Shaw. And since we you know, might as well add one more technical issue to others, uh, we are having some technical issues with Dr. Shaw's camera. So you will hear from Dr. Shaw today. You won't see Dr. Shaw, but know that he is listening right now. He's there and he will be doing a lot of the presentation and be able to answer your questions at the end, okay? Our speakers have disclosed the following financial relationships. Both Dr. Shaw and Dr. Joseph are both a part of the Speakers Bureau for Stryker Medical. And some of the good stuff, continuing education for nurses and respiratory therapists. This educational activity is approved for one contact hour. A link to obtain CE credits will be available at the conclusion of the webinar, and I'll go over a few details about how you get that. There's some additional accreditation information here that you can see, and of note, support for this educational activity has been provided by Stryker. All right, so hopefully we're done with technical issues. We got the formalities out of the way. Let's get to the presentation. Without any further ado, I turn it over now to Dr. Joseph. Thank you so much, Dr. Simmons. I appreciate the introduction and I'm very excited um, to start today. Uh, and I'm thank you very much for coming to be with us for the mechanical uh, CPR, the incredible journey. So we're gonna talk to you guys. Oh, I just skipped over something. Okay, so we are going to uh, describe the importance of high quality CPR, discuss some concepts of mechanical CPR, and list the key concepts and benefits of implementation of mechanical CPR for you guys today. So just to give a little bit of background, uh, cardiac arrest, they happen a lot. There's about 225,000 Americans that have out of hospital cardiac arrest, OCA, annually, and 200,000 in hospital cardiac arrest, also known as ICA, annually. And despite all of these, uh, all of these cardiac arrests, all the research that goes on, 
uh, in hospital and out of hospital. And with all of our knowledge, research, products available to assist us, we still have really relatively low survival to discharge percentages um, throughout the US and actually throughout the world. And despite that we have at our fingertips, you know, right now, so many different innovations, so many ideas, so much research, that really the only two things known one, with 100% certainty to help increase survival is really high quality CPR and early defibrillation for pulses, VT and VF. And these are the only two things that cannot be disputed in cardiac arrest, which is pretty amazing to think about. So I wanna give you guys a little history of CPR because I know that we all do it, we all know it, but <clears throat> it was actually, I like to call manual CPR my classic compressions, and I'm using air quotes here. But a few fun facts is that the first compressions were ever done in 1803. Go Dr. Moss. Uh, he was really a, a true innovator. And then Dr. Kreil um, also performed the first closed chest cardiac massage in the U.S. in the, the 19, uh, sorry, in 1904. And then in 1960, CPR as we now know it was really born. Um, and it's literally, quite literally, how we've trained forever. Um, it's an age old standard of how to do compressions. It's been upgraded obviously since the 1960s. We've had CPR 3.0, 5.0, you know, whatever, 6.0, who knows where we are now. But we really, when I say CPR, you know what I'm talking about. We push hard and fast at, you know, in two inches at a rate of 100 to 120. You have an image in your head when I'm saying this, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. And that's manual CPR. And we know what high quality CPR is, and it's hitting that two inch depth every single time at a rate of 100 to 120. But are we always doing it 100% of the time? You know, we all have training, we get certified every two years, we have simulations, we do so many different things, and we actually do it on real people all the time, but are we always doing it? So what I'm trying to get at here in the most roundabout way is it, maybe it's time for an upgrade. Um, I mean, we have watches that can do an ECG and computers in our little pockets and Dr. Kreil and Dr. Ma Mass would probably have their minds blown. So I, it may be time that we make CPR a little bit fancier. Um, so I'm gonna just shoot out a polling question to you guys um, to ask, does your institution, wherever you work, have feedback devices during arrest uh, to ensure that there's high quality CPR? Um, and so these can be an external device, something attached to a defibrillator, using end tidal CO2 to guide CPR, something of that nature. All right. Well, I think that the poll's in progress. Hopefully the numbers are coming in. And let's get ready to see those results, which I'm kind of excited to, to see. Or maybe I'm not, I don't know. <laughs> All right, of course we do, the, the winning answer. That makes me happy. Uh, I'm not sure. All right, that's legit. And then we push away and hope for the best. Hey, you know, it's worked for, for people for years. Um, so that's all really uh, helpful feedback. And um, and it's good to know what you guys are doing at your institutions while we go through this. So mechanical CPR, um, what is it and, and do I really want it? And so for those of you who haven't used them, mechanical CPR devices are automated devices that perform chest compressions during cardiac arrest without the need for a, a manual hands-on compressions. And I used to refer to them as, as unicorns of cardiac arrest, um, but quite honestly, I now think of it as like a calculator as opposed to using an abacus. Um, because why would we do something by hand if we can just pop in a few numbers and get the, you know, get the number we need? Um, why not do that? Um, so if you want to think about it, the basics of resuscitation, which we talked about, are the early defibrillations for pulses VT and VF, and then high quality compressions. We trust AEDs to shock for us, and then we've also drilled into people's heads to defibrillate early, which is great. But the manual compressions that have remained the standard of care for CPR, despite lots of training, even using feedback devices at the time, were somehow not able to hit the mark of a perfect rate and depth every single time. So a device that helps us to optimize CPR and doesn't get tired or distracted like humans can, and we can travel with, seems like something we should all be wanting. 
So there are some distinct benefits, um, and I just want to go really quickly through this, but there was a, uh, a study done uh, looking at the use of a, a Lucas versus manual compressions uh, during ambulance transports, and they wanted to look at, it was using porcine models, so not on real humans, um, but looking at, looking at the benefits, um, risk and benefits of these of these little porcine models here. Um, and what you're looking at here is basically all the black lines are are the the porcine um, that used the Lucas. And what you're really seeing is that when the Lucas was used as opposed to manual compressions, there was less of a drop in the cerebral perfusion pressure because there was less hands off time and you were getting high quality CPR continuously. Um, as well, the uh, end tidal CO2 stayed up and everything with the uh, Lucas was much higher and near perfect compressions the entire time. So there's two different types of mechanical CPR. Um, one is uh, piston, uh, which is a, a straight up and down. It's a pretty simple concept and, you know, I'm a person that uses them and can barely put Legos together with directions. So I'll tell you that one is a piston, so a straight up and down, um, and then like the Lucas device. And then the other it, type is a load distributing band device that squeezes in, so the auto pulse. So you can see both of them there. Um, and they are, there's pros and cons to both of them, um, which I'm not necessarily gonna get into, um, but those are the two different ways that people uh, or that you can do manual compressions and i just want to show you this is the this is the piston in in, in its works this is one of the lucases and you can see my video seems to be on a um a loop there um, but it's just straight up and down as you think of a piston in a car um so i do want to pull one more one more time to ask you guys um to just ask your opinion um, if you think there's a significant benefit to patient outcomes for uh, during cardiac arrest using mechanical CPR. Um, so just yes, most certainly, uh, nope, it has absolutely no impact or I am not sure at all. And this is really important just to kind of hear where you guys are, where, what you're thinking in right now at, at the beginning of the webinar. Um, before we kind of get into the the bones of it and i will talk about some research um and let's see if we can uh see the results now that people have had time to answer yes most certainly awesome no it has no impact and i'm not sure all right well i'm glad to hear there's a lot of yes most certainly but that's my bias <laughs> um all right so here we go so I want to I want to talk to you guys a little bit about the research um, because there's you know four really notable studies on this subject and um, everyone wants to see these studies that show that mechanical CPR is way better than manual CPR but unfortunately and it makes me want to cry inside to say that the data really isn't there yet um, although mechanical CPR is it's basically in its infancy um, we are just starting to use it not every hospital uses it but it's getting out there um, and these studies do they all have their flaws like most research there's you know there's pros and cons um, and most of them are focused on out of hospital cardiac arrest OCA you'll hear me refer to it um, and I just want to remind everyone that we really can't do um, a double blinded RCT with mechanical because it's just unethical to allow um, poor CPR um, to compare to mechanical um just to get results and most people do consider this the gold standard um, but we really we can't do that uh ethically so the CERC study just really quickly in 2014 was an unblinded randomized control trial in the us and uk focusing on oca so out of hospital it had 522 participants close to 5,000 enrolled and most were excluded um they showed an abnormally high quality of CPR, uh, manual CPR, and they were really just focusing on the rate. Um, however, that being said, <clears throat> they didn't study the depth of compressions, which is decently important when you're looking at compressions, and they didn't at all look at the neurological outcomes of patients. Um, the LINK study uh, was also focused on out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, and it was a randomized control trial in the EU. There were 589 patients, um, and it really wasn't a generalizable study as they included patients requiring CPR with defibrillators using the Lucas versus just plain manual CPR. Um, and then the paramedic study uh, in 2015 was a, a cluster randomized open, um, open label trial in 
with uh, over just shy of 4,500 at hospital cardiac arrest patients in the UK. Um, and either the Lucas or manual compressions were used based on the first truck to arrive. Um, so 60% of the patients did get mechanical CPR. That was the first truck to arrive. But there were a lot of issues with uh, devices during the trial. So only 15 events um, were able to be used. And it really wasn't set up for a long-term trial. And then most recently, just in 2021, in January, um, which I was really excited about this study, uh, the Compress RCT study um, came out. It's a multi-center feasibility randomized control trial in the UK. And they were focusing on adult in-hospital cardiac arrest, which made me really excited because it was an ICA, um, that were in non-shockable rhythms. And they randomized in a three-to-one ratio that they would more often receive mechanical CPR. Um, so out of this trial, there were only 127 participants, which was really small. And it was mostly because of the, the blinding that they were doing um, and funding um, that they had for the devices. So they didn't have very many devices to use during this study. Um, and one of the biggest limitations actually for them was time. Um, it was time to getting the device to the arrest and time of day. So their trained clinicians, uh, they wrote into the study, two had to be on site at all times, um, was difficult having 24 seven coverage and non and the number of non shockable rhythms. And I can honestly attest that anytime you want to do research on VTAC VF patients in hospital, they, they stop happening. So we, uh, the research doesn't tell us much other than it's not worse then really, really, really good manual CPR. And if you can honestly tell me that 100% of the time your hospital is doing 100% uh, perfect high quality CPR all the time, then gold star, good, you beat the Lucas or an auto pulse. Um, so a little bit more about pros and cons of, of mechanical CPR is that, um, and this is you know really looking at the cat lab because we're gonna go through a patient study, but they, Manual CPRs can be difficult to perform. We all know that. There's limited space in hospital rooms, in cath labs. Um, rescuers aren't always able to get in the perfect position. They may be reaching. They may be, you know, on tippy toes. Um, everything's not in perfect position. And it may, and you may have to do it for long periods of time and people get tired. People get tired before that two minutes are up. Um, and then in the cath lab, you have the added uh, bonus, if you will, of uh, ex. Um, being exposed to radiation. So the advantages of, of you know, mechanical CPR really are that it's uninterrupted chest compressions. There's no fatigue, there's no changing rescuers, it's on, you set it and forget it. Um, you're limiting your exposure to radiation if you're in the cath lab and it's less crowded. So it's less crowded in the cath lab, but it's also in a regular hospital room, it is less crowded. In an ED, less crowded. Um, so you're getting better quality chest compressions because you're getting a more consistent rate, depth, and release. So you're getting that squeeze you want. And just to kind of add fuel to the fire here, or more confusion as it were, but the AHA um, in the 2015 guidelines, um, they did say that the, the evidence doesn't demonstrate a benefit with uh, with mechanical CPR. However, they do say that they may be considered in specific settings uh, to deliver high quality CPR where it may be challenging. And I would say that almost all the time in the hospital is challenging because we've very many prolonged uh, arrests. Um, if there's, you know, limited rescuers available to do CPR uh, during ambulance rides, in cath labs, if you're going to be doing eCPR, um, and if it's, helps to limit interruptions during CPR. So um, that's a lot of times <laughs> that we would be able to use mechanical CPR um, and that it would actually benefit the patient. Um, and then the European Resuscitation Council similarly said it's a relative, a reasonable, sorry, alternative in situations where high quality manual chest compressions are impractical, in, sorry, impractic, impractical or compromise provider safety. So what practice is best? It's kind of up in the air at this point, but we do know that there are a lot of benefits to mechanical CPR. So we're gonna go through a case of using mechanical CPR in hospital. So there was a, uh, a 74 year old female patient uh, with a past medical history of CAD. They, uh, she had a cardiac arrest in 1995. Uh, also she had severe um, moderate arterial stenosis. Um, and had otherwise been doing, you know, fine living her life. 
uh, came into the hospital because she had an increased uh, SOB, which was related to fluid overload. Um, upon coming in, we found her BNP and her troponin were a bit up. The They did a CTA, which was negative. Um, the patient was in hospital doing fine. Actually, they were trying to figure out her next plan of care. Um, and all of a sudden, um, she was still getting IV, IV low pressor because she'd been at NPO and they were getting ready to switch her to POs. But all of a sudden, she became acutely unresponsive. So they called a code. So the code team arrives. And actually, the, the beginning of the code team is the pri are the primary nurses. And they jump on, they slap on the defibrillator, and they slap on the pads, and they start doing compressions. So I want to tell you, this is, this is the download that you're seeing. And you might say, I don't really know what I'm looking at. Looks like the heart's kind of flubbing around. I'm not seeing much. It's a non-shockable rhythm. What's going on? Well, what we're seeing here is actually really horrible CPR. So you're seeing that the compression rates are one anywhere from 133 to 162. That is extremely fast. That does not allow for full recoil. That does not allow the heart to refill. And it, so when they're doing compressions, I don't even know what they're squeezing out. Um, you can also see over here, there is a ton of hands-off time. Anytime you see these yellow lines, mostly that's hands-off time. Anytime you don't see red, hands-off time. And that is not good. Um, so you're seeing really poor CPR. And then the mechanical CPR device arrives. So we're seeing a little bit different from the picture before, right? We're still seeing those green lines. What does that mean? Those are actually the lines of compression. And then we're seeing the black line underneath, um, which is the, the heart rhythm. And with that rhythm, the first time you didn't see, I'm going to go back, the first time you didn't see that there was really much difference in this heart rhythm from these compressions. This time, we are seeing much more fluctuation in that heart rhythm after, after the, the compressions are done, and especially down here. So this is when the MCPR device was deployed and started. And you can see the heart is actually moving. And what I want to point out is that this last line is that we had over a minute of continuous CPR at a rate of 120. And they were going at a depth of two inches. And ROSC was achieved within that minute. So that was very exciting for us that as soon as the heart was able to refill, they were actually able to do high quality CPR. The patient got. ROSC. So the, we decided, well, let's pack up. We're going to go to the CCU. So while we are traveling to the coronary care unit with the patient, we did leave the M mechanical CPR device in place uh, just in case the patient lost her pulse. And we were right outside the door of the CCU. And thank goodness we left it in uh, place. The patient lost their pulse. Um, so we restarted mechanical CPR and then we headed right to the cath lab instead of heading left into the CCU. We had to change directions. So we did have to take a quick little elevator ride. Um, and everyone was very thankful that we were we had mechanical CPR while we were in the elevator because it was a bit crowded. So we left it in place as we were transporting to the cath lab. And now I'm going to introduce Dr. Shaw to take it from there and talk to us about the patient arrival in the cath lab. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Bridget. Um, again, my name is Altman Shaw. Thank you all for coming out. I'm an interventional cardiologist, and I apologize for not having my picture up, but, uh, you know, well, uh, you can just draw a stick figure with a smiley face, and that'll do. So this is really, really exciting. So when you're looking at this particular picture, this is a patient who comes into the cath lab. And those of you who work into the cath lab know that it's a very busy place. You can see that there's radiation. Uh, people should wear lead. There's a lot of, a lot of equipment. And so here what we can see is the Lucas device on the patient giving compressions while we're taking pictures. Now, why is this important? Well, this is important because, uh, number one, there's no one giving compressions while we're taking pictures. So no one's being exposed to radiation. And number two, no one's breaking their back trying to reach over this patient to give compressions. Now, one really important point I'd like to make here is that the Lucas does have a tower that is elevated. 
So we do need to take views that are maybe a little more caudal or a little more cranial, views that we may not be comfortable using on a day-to-day -day basis, but we get comfortable in these really critically ill situations. Now, I will make a point here that saying, I know uh, Bridget had mentioned that uh, mechanical CPR is relatively new. There is one other device in the United States approved for uh, mechanical compression. That's the uh, Autopulse. Now, the Autopulse does not have the tower, but it does have a circuit board on the back that prevents any assessment of the coronaries, any type of angiography. So that's why we don't use it, and that's why we see the Lucas here. We can see it's a controlled environment. I'm sorry this video isn't playing, but rather than kind of the uh, dumpster fire that can happen with cardiac arrest in the cath lab, this is a very controlled environment as we're able to go ahead and do the uh, angiogram. Now, coming to the cath lab in cardiac arrest is becoming de facto standard of care. We know that patients who have out of hospital or in hospital VT arrests should come to the cath lab. The thought process is there could be a left main lesion, there could be an LED lesion, but more importantly, it's something that we can address. We can open up the coronary artery, but more importantly or equally important is remember when there's cardiac arrest, there's post-resuscitation myocardial dysfunction. That even though we may open up the artery, the myocardium is not functional because of issues with calcium sequestration from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So you have what's called kind of a stone heart that can affect contractility and relaxation of both the LV and the RV. So the importance of going to the cath lab then is not only can we take pictures, but we can also potentially do mechanical cardiopulmonary support, be it a balloon pump, be it an impella, be it VA ECMO, we can do transcutaneous pacing. But the other really important uh, part of the cath lab, it's not just coronary angiography. And in this particular case, I apologize, these, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, we've only been doing Zoom and go to meetings for about 14 months, and I still can't get my videos to play appropriately. But uh, it, what we're going to see here is we see a massive PE. And so we know that about 200 to 300,000 Americans every year suffer PEs, and we're slowly becoming more aggressive in terms of how to treat those pulmonary embolism. And one of them is the cath lab, and this particular patient had a massive PE, which we were then able to go ahead, extract, and treat. Um, <clears throat> this is an example of not just PEs, but this is a patient, and unfortunately can't really show it because my video is not playing here, but at the bottom of the screen, we see the Lucas device, we see the catheter coming up from the femoral approach, a JL4 catheter engaging in the left main coronary artery, and this is a patient who came in with an occluded LAD. And so this, now can you just imagine us trying to wire an LAD and open up a left anterior descending with someone's hands on the screen we're worried about that person getting full frontal radiation, right? And so this is really important because if you're not working in the cath lab, in general, you don't have a radiation safety badge. And so we can't track the amount of radiation our responders are being exposed to. We have no follow-up on them, and it's just an uncomfortable situation. So having the Lucas there will allow us to go ahead, take pictures of the coronary arteries, and open it up and fix it. And so this particular case was a patient who came in. Uh, the second case was just a, a, another example. But a cardiac arrest can be triggered by pulmonary embolism. We identified pulmonary angiography. We were able to go ahead and extract the clot. Now, there's a lot of different ways to extract the clot. In this particular way, we used uh, ECOS catheter. And then in the middle of the night, we're not really always able to get lower extremity ultrasounds. Maybe in your hospital, you can. Our hospital, not really. So we went ahead and put an IVC filter and then went ahead and transferred the patient, uh, who then fully recovered. So this is the importance that we're going to go ahead and keep getting good compressions, right? Because if we can't get good compressions, we're not going to have good forward flow. We're not going to have cerebrovascular recovery, which is also an important part as well. So why is it really important to take the patient to the cath lab uh, right away? Now, this is a very large study, uh, and a lot of these, as uh, Bridget pointed out earlier, a lot of these studies are small. A lot of them are hard to do, but we take what we can take. So this study, about 93 patients, a little tongue-in-cheek, not that large, but these are patients in Italy who had return of spontaneous circulation or ROSC after cardiac arrest. Only uh, now, 66 of these patients underwent PCI, 48 within two hours. Obvious non-cardiac arrest patients were excluded. So if they had a hatchet in their back or they found them in a ditch, uh, with, a, with a bottle of uh, <clears throat> Chianti, they were excluded. But if they weren't non, uh, not obvious non-cardiac, then they were included. So what did we find by just taking the patients to the lab? So just by taking patients to the lab, if you look at this slide, on the first side, if a patient was greater than 60 years of age, on your left-hand side, more mortality, age greater than 60, independently associated with mortality. However, emergent coronary angiography, and not sucking out their clot, not looking at their LED, just taking them to the cath lab was associated with survival.
Again, now find a lesion, we can see on this forest plot, successful emergent PCI was also associated with increased survival. But on the very next slide, the last slide, which is also really important, we know that age greater than 60 in this particular study and in many other studies is associated with increased mortality and cardiac arrest. We can see a delay in coronary angiography is also associated with increased mortality. So it's really, really important, not only in patients who have out of hospital cardiac arrest, but also in hospital cardiac arrest, to get them to the cath lab as quickly as possible. And this slide kind of shows what the benefits are. Yes, we can do coronary angiography. We can also do a right heart catheterization. We can assess what their filling pressures are, whether they need additional mechanical cardiopulmonary support. Pulmonary angiography, we can do intravascular hypothermia. So going to the cath lab isn't just taking pictures of the coronaries, it's taking pictures of just everything we need and then allowing the heart to heal by instituting hemodynamic support. So when we talk about what we can also do in the cath lab, especially with in-hospital cardiac arrest, now we've got ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. And by we, I mean the cath lab. You know, cardiologists are grabby people. We like to take things. And this was usually in the purview of cardiothoracic surgery. But just, uh, just to review what an ECMO circuit does, it takes blood out of the venous system. It go ahead and pumps it pumps it through a membrane oxygenator. I like to take pe tell people it's like a set of gills of fish. Oxygenates the blood, takes some more CO2 off, warms the blood and returns it to the arterial circulation. It externalizes the pumping function and the respiratory function of the patient to allow them to completely heal. Because remember these patients, the cardiac arrest, have LV dysfunction, they may have RV dysfunction, and now we're able to go ahead and fully uh, support them. There are a couple of different flavors of ECMO. And again, many hospitals, including those of you in the audience, ECMO can be done in the ED, it can be done in the cath lab, but urgent initiation of ECMO is gonna be really, really helpful. And I'm gonna show that in order to get an emergent initiation of ECMO, having mechanical cardiopulmonary support is critical. So when we think about ECMO, and I apologize for this review for those of in the audience that are facile with this technology and this verbiage, we have VV ECMO and V ECMO. V is the first letter always refers to where the blood is coming from. Venus, V, A, where the blood is going. V, A, ECMO takes blood from the venous system, returns to the arterial system. Now, as we learned in the last 12 months, oftentimes many viral infections can cause severe pulmonary dysfunction. So we can do V, V, ECMO, where we take deoxygenated venous blood, oxygenated because the lungs aren't working, but the heart may be, and return oxygenated blood to the venous system. So those are kind of the two flavors. There are VVA, VVA, I'm sorry, VVA and VAV. We'll uh, not spend too much time on that. Now, this is kind of what the circuit looks like in the cath lab. We can see that we have, in this particular case, a 15 French arterial cannula, a 21 French venous cannula. And then because these cannula are quite large, we're talking about 15, 17, 18 French cannula in the arteries, we need to make sure we have distal perfusion. Because the last thing any of us want is to have, a, as Bridget mentioned, a cardiac arrest in the hospital. We put the glucose on, we get the patient back, and they have to go home with an amputation because they have a cold leg. So over here is our antegrade perfusion that gives blood to uh, the SFA so that the leg can stay perfused while the cannula are in place. Now, should we do eCPR, extra uh, ECMO-assisted CPR for all cardiac arrests? Well, a lot of trials are suggesting yes. And just in terms of historical context, a lot of these trials started in, uh, in Japan and in Taiwan and in Korea, uh, and their out-of-hospital survival rates are, gosh, close to about 40%. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that. Now, number one, in Japan, all kids who graduate from high school have to be effectively BLS certified. And many of, many of them are ACLS certified. They start learning uh, BLS in the fifth grade. But there's also really, uh, they were really early adopters of early eCPR. And so Dr. Hanea first started looking at 85 patients who had out of hospital cardiac arrest and a median CPR time of 40 minutes. Whoa, how do you even get to 40 minutes of CPR time? You gotta have really good compressions or you gotta have mechanical CPR. And by taking these patients to the cath lab and putting them on ECMO right away, survival was 30%. Again, not 100%, but 30% much higher than Cook County in uh, Illinois, much higher than Wayne County in Detroit, much higher than about 50% of the municipalities. And in fact, Kings County in Seattle, probably in, uh, also in Boston, they're probably close to 35, 40%, maybe getting close to 50, but 30% in the early uh, 2012s was really great. And intact neurofunction, 94%. So not only people are surviving, but they have intact neurofunction. Not only is it important to get an eCPR, this is where in-hospital is really important because the patient's already in the hospital. We know that door to balloon times are absolutely critical, right? We have all these meetings, we gotta fill out this paperwork, door to balloon time less than 90 minutes. Now we have medical contact to balloon time less than 90 minutes. 
It also is really, really important to have emergent or as quick eCPR as possible. This particular slide from uh, Scandinavia, I believe it was Norway, looked at patients who had uh, eCLS initiated within 30 minutes or after 30 minutes. And if you look at this Kaplan-Meier curve, you can see door to eCLS less than 30 minutes is associated with almost a quadrupling of survival compared to ECLS greater than taking 30 minutes. So identifying these patients early and starting them early on ECLS, and an important component of that is not only the, uh, not only the eCPR, uh, it's not only CPR, mechanical CPR, but also getting them on ECMO. So it really, uh, if you get them in fast, they're gonna do a lot, lot, lot better. Now, in hospital cardiac arrest, uh, this is a really, really exciting article. This came out in The Lancet several years ago looked at about 1,000 patients with in-hospital cardiac arrest, looked at about 113 patients who received CPR, and about 60 got ECPR, ECLS and uh, CPR. And so with this particular trial, this is really exciting. Now, if you look in this lower corner, I'm sorry, this has shrunk a little bit. We can see in the corner, these are all in-hospital cardiac arrest. At the bottom on the x-axis is time less than 30 minutes, 30 to 45 minutes, then 45 to 60, and then greater than 60 minutes. This is time of CPR. Now, the blue is traditional CPR. The lavender, lavender mauve, you know, I'm a little colorblind, so I'm not sure. We'll call it purple, is eCPR. And look at survival. If patients had less than 30 minutes of arrest and 30 minutes of CPR, conventional CPR, their survival was 20%. If they had eCPR, it was almost over 40%. But look what happens. And a lot of times we have these patients, we get ROSC, and then they lose their pulse again. And we keep, keep going. Now, in these really heroic efforts where CPR lasts more than 60 minutes, there were no survivors in patients who had traditional CPR, none. Yet, you almost had 20% survival in patients at eCPR. Again, looking at the ability to give good quality CPR and get them eCLS as quickly as possible. And a huge component, as you can imagine, how many responders are you going to run through or am I going to run through if you're giving a code for greater than 60 minutes? These patients aren't surviving unless they're having mechanical CPR. So we do need to worry about, there's some things about ECMO. We know that as we're, especially in the cath lab, we're doing peripheral ECMO, so we're returning blood in the femoral artery. So all this flow theoretically is pumping against a really, really weak heart. Uh, and so uh, what many, uh, what one of Dr. Naveen Kapoor out of Boston had kind of been the first to show that we probably should unload the LV uh, so that, we can not have the LV squeeze against this continuous flow from the ECMO. So having patients on a balloon pump, on an impeller device as well, is also gonna be helpful. But again, this is really important. This is why going to the cath lab is really critical. So we can see what's going on in the right heart. We can see what's going on in the left heart pressures. And if we need to put a balloon pump, in addition to the ECMO, we can. If we need to put an impeller, we can. But again, these patients have a high rate of recidivism. They may arrest again. Having mechanical uh, CPR is the cornerstone of this type of therapy. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Joseph um, and happy to answer questions later on. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. And I appreciate you for pointing out the difference about the um, autopulse versus Lucas in the cath lab. I did forget to point that out. So thank you. Um, so I want to talk to you guys about a little bit about tips and trips, uh, tricks for use of, of mechanical CPR, because there's a lot of little tricks with placing specifically the, the piston motioned mechanical CPR devices. So it requires a little bit of teamwork, communication to coordinate, but the placement tends to be a barrier I hear about a lot at my institution and, and others. It's about uh, comfort and working as a team. So I'm gonna show you guys this little um, video clip here, and I think it's like a silent movie. Um, but you can see they're doing compressions, they roll the patient over, um, very, well, very little hands off time and then they're gonna um and then they're gonna place the device over using that backboard and that's one of the key uh pieces there with i don't know why that's happening again uh that's one of the key pieces with uh with training is to show people the the placement of the backboard especially with the the piston devices because it does need to clip into that backboard and there's two different ways to place it so you can either do the traditional which i just showed you of rolling the place uh patient or you can coordinate with the team and just lift up the shoulders and pull the backboard right underneath um either works just as well either limits hands-off time pretty significantly um 
and it goes right as you can see there's near sec not even seconds that they were hands off of doing compressions um, but that's one thing is showing people that there are different ways to place these devices um, one of the big things with training um, that you need to do a lot of before you have them and then a lot of once you get them um, is that you want to train, 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 wash, rinse, repeat until they literally tell you to shut up and they verbatim tell you what you have been saying to them. Because uh, then I know, that's how I know my staff have it. Uh, when they repeat back to me and it's like I'm talking to myself, uh, I know that I've infiltrated their brain and I also know that they know how to use this device as well as I do. Um, and one big thing to point out during training is that, um, which is a huge benefit, and both Dr. Shaw and I haven't mentioned mentioned this yet, but is that when you're using a mechanical CPR device, you can actually shock while you are still doing compressions. So um, it's a huge habit to break, just like when we stop doing pre-shock pauses for pulse checks. Um, it takes a minute for people to learn that, but it's a huge plus for lose for losers for users um, that they can just uh, do that shock and continue the CPR. And one thing that I implemented actually when doing training is not only showing the, the various different ways that you can put the backboard under the patient to coordinate with the team, um, either rolling them or lifting their shoulders up, um, but also is that once the device is in place and you pull the plunger down to where that X is I have on that patient's chest right there, um, I have staff put a little, um, take a Sharpie and put a little mark underneath um, the, the suction cup. Um, that way, when you are when you stop for a rhythm check, um, someone can also kind of peek at the plunger and make sure that that hasn't moved um, and that it's still in place. So if you see that black line, you are golden and you can restart compressions without worry that it has traveled or moved too much. And I also remind them, because one thing that people forget is to put the, the neck strap in place um, because it does help to keep devices in place and decrease movement of the device. Um, just like anything else, I mean, it is a piston going up and down, so it, it can travel. Um, so we really want to make sure that it stays in the right place uh, so that it maintains its effectiveness. And one thing that I'm going to point out that I missed to emphasize during training is that there is a, for the Lucas specifically, uh, there is a plug that goes through the backpack um, that you carry the Lucas device in, um, and it is very dainty. Uh, and um, you have to remind folks to actually pull the plug out or you will they'll grab the bag and run to an event to a coding patient um, and they rip and pull that plug out. And when that cracks, that is one expensive, expensive error. So just remind people of that on the logistics end. Um, the other thing is that for uh, for the uh, band or the load bearing, uh, devices. Uh, there are certain patients that can fit in and, and not fit in. And as Dr. Shaw mentioned, with the um, with the auto pulse, for example, um, you the, you can't bring that into the cath lab because there is a you know a motherboard that can be seen. Um, and it's also important to mention that there are specific patients that can fit in that and that are too large to fit in that uh, because it is a band that goes around a patient. Um, with, I'm showing you uh, specifically here, the, the Lucas device, um, but for the PIS, so for the piston style, you, it can fit larger patients. And a lot of our staff, when we first implemented it, would assume, no, we can't place the, the Lucas on this patient, they're too big. Um, but they're really not looking at the correct placement of the patient because you're not looking at their belly. You're looking at just from armpit to armpit. Um, so as long as, you know, and, and most patients don't carry their weight up there. Um, so it really needs to be in the upper chest sternum area. Um, so I tried to debunk myths as much as possible. Um, so you want to make sure that they're not just looking at a patient and deciding not to use it and that it's not going to fit. And we actually look at um, we look at ways to try and to try and prevent that. But actually, this poster uh, that we put out showed a lot, a lot of people that you can't look at a patient to decide if it can fit or not. So I do want to kind of think about these things that we've talked about and ask you all. Um, where will your journey lead you? Because I know that we talked a little bit about the research and not all of the research that's out currently uh, between, you know, what Dr. Shaw talked, 
spoke about and then me is that not everything points that mechanical CPR for in-hospital cardiac arrest is, you know, this golden goose of an egg. Um, but there are benefits to both staff and patients. Um, there are, you know, we don't do high quality CPR 100% of the time when we're using our hands. Um, it's just a fact. <laughs> um, I would love if we could, but we don't. Um, but I want, so I want you guys to think about that as well as using clinical data from your institution's events and your hospital's culture to support this use. There may be some stuff going on at your hospital that you can pull from events and you would be able to support utilizing these devices to really benefit your hospital, benefit your staff, and benefit your patients and their outcomes. I really do think that the research is going to start to show that uh, the more we start using mechanical CPR, the more benefits that we're going to see from it. So we hope that this information leads to you guys utilizing mechanical CPR at your institutions or using it more uh, to support high quality CPR for intra-hospital events. And I want to thank you all so much for attending this webinar today. It concludes our presentation and I look forward to all of your questions. And But before we begin the, the question period, James will let everyone know how to get their, their CEs. So thank you so much for attending today. Thank you, uh, Bridget and Atman, for a really, really awesome, informative uh, session. I learned a lot. Y'all have a ton of questions, so <laughs> we're going to get to those questions in just a minute. Um, but before we begin the Q&A session, I do have a few reminders for the audience. So, continuing education for nurses and respiratory therapists. This activity is approved for one program contact hour, okay? So, to get that, you're going to go to www and i say that not because i'm old school but because the www is important okay so you actually have to put the www in dot saxtesting.com slash sl okay www dot saxtesting.com slash sl and you see that on your screen there you will need to register on the site complete an evaluation form and then once that's done once you've submitted that you'll be able to print your certificate of completion okay um, again, a reminder that this educational activity was provided by Stryker. Thank you. Um, also, there is an archive version, an on-demand version, that will be available at savinglivesnow.org. So if you registered for this, whoever registered for your group, if you're watching in groups or whomever, an email will be sent to all registrants when that archive version is available. Okay. And the on-demand version is still also accredited for nurses and respiratory therapists, okay, for your CE. So now that those particulars are out of the way, let's get to some of these questions. Um, I actually, I, this one just popped up, but I think it's really sort of interesting and it's quick. We'll try to get through as many of these as we can. We have about a little over 10 minutes to get through some of these questions. Um, so Bridget and Atman, is the incidence of rib cage fractures increased with mechanical devices not that it necessarily matters because we expect that the question asker says but is that increase um is the incidence of rib fractures increased uh i can i, I can have otman uh, dr shaw uh, respond as well i have not seen an increase um actually in in rib cage uh in any sort of rib injuries uh during mechanical cpr um, in my experience, and I don't believe that the research shows an increase either. Um, but I know that it's something that people ask about and worry about. Yeah, no, I'm just going to jump in exactly. The research doesn't show increased rib fractures. Um, and what's really, you know, what's really interesting is that oftentimes we'll all see these patients, we'll get a, you know, six foot two, 200 pound uh, person gunning me on the chest. And this, you know, the patient will have rib fractures from conventional CPR. But I think what's really important here is that, you know, not all mechanical CPR is the same. Uh, the first mechanical compression device was the actual thumper, which actually was a piston that looked like it was on a C-arm. Now, that thumper was the one that people think, oh, gosh, mechanical CPR. I remember liver lacerations. I remember uh, rib fractures. Now, the, the thumper is not available and no longer used or approved by the FDA for mechanical CPR. But I think, uh, you know, the thumper, unfortunately, was associated with a lot of negative outcomes. And I think a lot of the, the concerns with the current Lucas device come from the thumper. But in short term, Lucas not associated with increased uh, fractures, no increased liver lacerations, which the thumper was associated with. 
And that's also, and that's excellent. I actually forgot about the thumper. Um, but it, that's also why we do, like in the tips and tricks, and I was saying to kind of mark the placement of the plunger and to use the next strap. Um, that's why it's really important to make sure the placement is is optimal um, and that it doesn't move during uh, during use because when it's in proper position, you the risk of any of those is very low, any injuries. Very good, thank you for that. Okay. Lots of questions about this. So they've varied a little bit, but I'm gonna throw them all together in one question. Many folks are saying, wait a minute, did you say that a shock can be given during uh, use of this device, during MCPR use? And does it matter which device? Can a shock be given with if, if the Lucas or another device is being used? Well, I'm going to tell you that is the big benefit of, of mechanical CPR uh, and with the Lucas that you can shock while it is in use. And I believe the same is uh, true for the auto pulse. Um, you can shock while it's while it's on. Although I'm not I shouldn't speak for the auto pulse because I'm not 100 percent certain about that. Dr. Shaw, do you know? Yes, so that's a great question. And I think, you know, to kind of step back is that how often when we check for, we do a pulse check, we take our hands off the chest. All of a sudden, sometimes, you know, in the best case scenarios, we minimize the time, but sometimes 30, 45, 60 seconds can go by with no compressions and we're trying to feel a pulse and then we decide to shock. With mechanical compression, it's awesome, right? You can just shock right through it. You can, uh, there's, while you can still shock through the auto pulse, there are reports that shocking through the auto pulse can throw can cause the auto pulse to pause and it won't restart its uh, band assisted compressions as soon as it's supposed to those are incidental anecdotal reports but that is the theoretical concern with the auto pulse thank you for that both of you uh next question do you have recommendations on when to place the lucas this is for an in-hospital cardiac arrest um, as soon as it arrives or at the next pause in compressions there apparently has been a little conflict between um, staff that arrive with the device versus who's running the code as to when to actually place the device for a, a better outcome so i i will say that uh there you don't want to stop anything that's in progress to place the lucas so if you are doing manual cpr and you are um you know you are you've already shocked the patient and you are restarting compressions um, and you have something showing you that you are doing good manual compressions that your end tidal co2 is pretty high and that you know, stopping to even turn the patient to put the backboard underneath would impact negatively CPR. I would say to wait until there is a natural break, but also working with the co-team leader um, because they ultimately should be saying, okay, this is a, a natural break in CPR. Um, this is when we'd be exchanging uh, or changing over who's doing compressions anyways, let's place it. You don't want to stop what you're doing that can benefit the patient and that is benefiting the patient to place it, but you do want to get it into place relatively quickly. There's no there's no benefit to placing a, a Lucas device you know, 25 minutes into a code, you've already been doing probably not so great manual compressions for, you know, maybe 20 of that 25 minutes. Uh, so you do want to make sure that, you know, it's it's earlier on uh, in the in the arrest, but if it's not there the second you start the arrest, that's okay, but you don't want to delay a shock and you don't want to, you know, if you've just started a round of compressions, you don't want to stop to cause, you know, perhaps a drop in CPP or any other issues to the patient just to place that device. Speaking of, of placement, um, Bridget, and I think maybe you can continue with this one as well. There's lots of sort of various questions around placement and how maybe easy is it to get the device placed in the proper uh, alignment versus having more of like diaphragmatic or belly compressions, right? That the, that the device is actually high enough. And if you, if you, let's say you've put it on there and you don't have an ETCO2 hooked up right away, is there a way to tell that you're in the right place with the device? Well, I mean, you want to be seeing that you're getting some sort of change in rhythm, right? Just like with manual CPR. So if you're looking at your defibrillator and, you know, you are placing it, you're going to have the backwards was right up here. So like the backboard will be right under the armpits and then it clicks in, clicks in. And when you push it down, um, first of all, if it's in improper placement or the patient doesn't fit, the, the machine's going to, it doesn't tell you if, you know, you're, 
if it if it gets pressure back that it's in a relatively okay place um but it will beep if it's you know if it's going in too low or it can't get down it's going to give you some information that it might not be fitting but it but that being said it is a machine and it is expecting you to get it in the right position. Um, so I will say that as long as you are able to get that backboard in so that it's, you know, coming out the, the place that you clip are, you know, in the armpit area. Um, and when you pull that plunger down, you should be looking, that should be the same place that you're putting in the palm of your hand when you're doing compressions. So you want to make sure that you get it and then and then you're starting and when you, when it does those first couple of compressions look at the defibrillator and look at the waveform you want to see that there's a change if there's no change in the in the heart rhythm it may not be the 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 right location you can also put you know your hand on the femoral pulse and feel if you're getting you know a, a pulse uh if you're getting some sort of blood out that that might be the the right spot um but until you have something a little bit more high tech in place um you kind of have to go off of looking at the rhythm and feeling for a pulse i think there definitely is um you know conversation around sort of changing practice um in general and sort of getting everyone used to this being something new right just like you mentioned earlier about like pausing to do pulse checks before shocking things like that right like those of us who are dinosaurs and have been at this forever like trying to change this is really difficult so there's i'm kind of lumping a bunch of questions in and then bridget or admin either one of you if you can sort of um talk to this there's some questions about sort of is it worth it to take the time to put the the loop device on maybe a larger patient versus like do you have time in between when you're pausing manual compressions maybe manual compressions started the device has arrived you can't get it fit is this patient too small is it too big whoever's running the code doesn't want to use it there's lots of questions about people are seeming to have those types of issues in the very moment and how you can kind of mitigate those um, I mean, so I, not to step on Dr. Uh, Shaw's toes, uh, this is something I deal with literally uh, pretty constantly every day. Um, so I will say that if you, if there is any sort of issue with the team with uh, not wanting to try the Lucas or not wanting to place it, um, at least you can kind of get the backboard. If, if there's a natural break, you can, you know, work with the team to get the backboard under place uh, or sorry, under the patient and in place. Um, and if there's any concern that if the patient is either too large or too small and you try it and it, you get a beep or you're like, what? Abort mission, take it off, go back to manual compressions. And then you can do the, look at the, quick uh there's quick tip reference sheet in with all of the the devices so you can kind of look and see okay why was that beeping like that and they're like oh we didn't pull the plunger all the way down all right take two so the next time there's a, a pulse check and there's a little break you can try and snap it back into place uh pull the plunger down and try again it could be that the battery's be dead you know it is a mechanical device there could be a million different issues um you know and it and with codes you know they are high stake um events they are things where communication is key um so it's all about working with the team if if someone's staunchly opposed to using it i guess you have to kind of kind of go with it you can say what you feel and that you want to try using it and that you think that the patient would fit um usually people will listen and eventually give in um in my experience, maybe I just talk them down uh, to a point that they that they say fine. Um, but you do want to you do want to give it um, the best try that you can, um, because I every time that that case I showed you guys earlier, everyone said, oh, the CPR was perfect. It was so good. And then I download it and well, at a rate of 160, it was not so good. It was not helping the patient. And that's why we got a pulse as soon as we put the Lucas on and we were actually refilling the heart. So I do think a lot of it is about communication and I'll throw it to Dr. Shaw if there's, um, if he has any other advice. Yeah, no, that's great. And it's look, it's, there's always a learning curve. And uh, when we first started at U of C, um, we had early adoption from cath lab and floor but we had real difficulty in the ED. And the ED thought that, hey, you know, we can do better compressions. We don't want to interrupt. The size is an issue. And so what we did was we had a lot of training. And so as part of our just uh, annual ACLS, part of what we incorporated was transitioning from ma uh, manual CPR to Lucas so that everyone going through for their yearly certification would go ahead and be able to see how easy it was. Now, there are some patients who are unfortunately too big for the device. 
uh, and they won't fit. There are some people who uh, don't, it doesn't work, but what ends up really working is finally about three years when the ED would bring patients to the cath lab and we'd put the Lucas on and they'd see how seamless and easy it was, they would buy in. So just to echo uh, what Bridget had said, uh, just, you know, this constant education, practice trial and error, uh, good communication, uh, because people will see the fruits, uh, fruits of this intervention. Yeah, and really training on every aspect, training with, you know, in mock codes, in simulation, and then when they see it happening and the team, and you have a core team that bought it in and buys into it and that wants to do it, and they get really good at it, like Dr. Shaw on the cath lab, like you have a team that's really into it. When people see it and see it in use, all of those negative things kind of fly out of their head and they're like, yes, I want to use this. I want to do it. Mm, that's great. I, I like lots of things in life, right? Sort of, we sort of have to see it to believe it. And then, then we go with it. I'm, unfortunately, we are so out of time. I'm so sorry. There were, there were like tens, almost a hundred questions. So I'm sorry we weren't able to get to all of them. Um, but I re really appreciate everyone uh, putting up with our technical issues, by the way. Um, and really thank you so much for coming to this presentation. And then Tracy has just a little bit more information for you as we wrap up. Thank you, James, and thanks to both our speakers today for such a fabulous present uh, presentation. We'd like to thank everyone for attending this webinar. There will be a survey, survey immediately upon the conclusion of this web webinar. You will be presented with an online survey. Please keep your web browser open, and we appreciate your feedback. For the CE Certificate of Completion, in one hour following the conclusion of this webinar, you will receive an email with instructions and the link to obtain your CE credits. For those of you, again, it's www.saxtesting.com backslash SL, so not S-I-S-L, um, to obtain your CE credits. We thank you all again for attending and have the great rest of your day.